It is now time for a question period. The member from Leeds Springbok. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is uh, through you to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Premier, you can implement your mandate with your Liberal majority, but it doesn't mean you have to break the rules of the Legislature. The standing orders state that the membership of committees must be in proportion to the representation of the parties in the House. This has been a long-standing tradition that your government House leader rejects. Your speech from the throne states that you'll pledge partnership over partisanship, that you want to increase transparency and accountability, and that you want to allow the Justice Committee to write its report. It's sheer arrogance for your party to change the rules of this legislature. Premier, why are you trying to prevent the opposition from holding your government to account? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know that the House Leader will have uh, more to say and that this is an ongoing discussion among the House Leaders, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, let's talk about tradition. For decades, Mr. Speaker, a majority in the House has met a majority on committees, yeah. Mr. Speaker. And that is, that, is a principle, that is a principle that every party in this House, when they have been in government and when they have been the, in the majority, they have argued for, Mr. Speaker, and that has been reflected in the committee structure. So uh, we're not aware of any instance in the history of this legislature where that has not been the case. Whoa, so, Mr. Speaker, in fact, it would be arrogance, I would suggest, to propose otherwise than that we follow that tradition of when there is a majority of seats in the House, that majority is reflected Answer. in committee. Back to the Premier. Uh, the government House Leader understands, according to the current rules, he could strike all the standing committees today with a substantive order. motion. However, in order to do so, he'd have to apply the long-standing formula that requires proportional representation of the parties in the legislature. So that would mean you would have five Liberal members, two PC members, and two NDP members. Orange, eHealth, the gas plants, the Mars building bailout. All of those scandals happened on the Liberal watch, and they came out because the opposition held the government to account. Premier, your throne speech stated you wanted to increase transparency. Is your first order of business to backtrack on that commitment by trying to stack the committees against the opposition? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the member opposite for his question. And I'm very much looking forward to discussing all these issues in a House Leaders meeting. I find it uh, odd that uh, the member opposite have chosen to raise these issues here in the House. As much as he's aware, these are discussions that are limited to uh, House leaders. Uh, but, uh, Speaker, the rules are very clear. The convention is very clear, as, this, uh, as the Premier mentioned. Uh, if you look back uh, throughout the history of uh, this, uh, this, this parliament, uh, going back decades, we have seen when there ever, whenever there is a majority uh, in the House, uh, committees, all committees have also demonstrated a simple majority uh, for uh, for the for the for the government, uh, Speaker, and that that means that we don't count the chair uh, in that calculation because, as Speaker, you know the chair is an impartial uh, uh, person and they cannot be calculated in in that uh, configuration. So I, I simply yes, ask uh, the member uh, opposite uh, that we work within the traditions of this House to make Thank sure you. that uh, the House is reflected Thank in the committee. You. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, uh, again, again, Speaker, I, I'm going to read you a couple of quotes. Here's a couple of quotes for you. Quote, the rules say two important things. One, committee Committees can have no more than nine members, and two, committee membership must be in proportion to the representation of the parties in the House. Who said that, Premier? The Dean of the Legislature, the member for St. Catharines. That was his quote. Here's another quote from the Minister of Education. 
One of the principles on which standing committee membership is normally structured, which is proportional representation. Proportional representation means if you've got nine members on a committee, you'll have five members from the Liberal Party, two members from the PC Party, and two members from the NDP. Five members provides a majority of representation in the House. Question. Why is the government House Leader continuing to try to muzzle the opposition by not following the conventions of this legislature? Speaker, um, since we're since we're quoting things to each other, let me just quote the the previous House Leader for the PC Party, now the the leader of the opposition. This is what he said in 2011, after the minority government was elected. He said. I quote, the official opposition is in the belief that the government does not have a majority in the House and therefore should not have a majority on committees. The NDP House leader, the member from Timmis, James Bay, said, and I quote, our proposals have been based on precedent. Uh, and I'm going to send you out if I have to. <laughs> you ask the question, listen to the response. I'm, uh, uh, and, and the interjection is not helpful either. Stop the clock. Uh, what, from what I've heard, I've decided I'm going to do what I did yesterday. I'm going into warnings. Finish, please. Speaker, the member from Timmins, James Bays, who is the NDP House leader, said on December 7th of 2011, our proposals have been based on precedent which dictates that a government which does not have a majority in the House does not have the majority in committees. Speaker, we only yes, ask that inverse be true as well. Thank you. Oh. The question the from Martin Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question uh, this morning is to the Premier. Premier, as you know, Moody's Debt Service recently downgraded Ontario's debt outlook from stable to negative, which will surely lead to increased costs and more underfunding of important services for average, everyday people in our province. Premier, we recommend that you take urgent action today to come up with ways of growing our economy to ensure our health care and education systems are protected. And here's one that makes good sense to me. Premier Brad Wall of Saskatchewan has been advocating for a Canada-wide free trade zone. There is a tremendous potential to create good jobs for people and help small businesses grow here in the province. Premier, do you see anything wrong with the Canada free trade zone as advocated by Premiers Wall, Clark and Hancock? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of <laughs> I have trouble with that too sometimes. And infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it, it, it actually is a very important uh, issue and a, and a question and something Ontario has always taken a lead on. Uh, we have advocated uh, across this country freer trade among provinces. In fact, Mr. Speaker, our exports are valued at over $122 billion as of 2012. 33% of Ontario's gross domestic product is made up of, of interprovincial trade accounts, so that's a very important to us. We will continue to work with our sister uh, provinces across this country to open up freer trade. Our priority is making sure we answer to the uh, challenges our business community may have uh, when, when the, uh, the Canada-European uh, trade agreement comes in place. We want to make sure that Answer. no Canadian business is at a disadvantage. That's our first priority. We'll work with the other province to ensure we achieve that, and we, if we can move further, we certainly would like to. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. Premier, last week Moody's uh, put the province on a credit watch and revised the outlook in Ontario from stable to negative. At the same time, Premier, your counterparts from across the country are focused on providing more consumer choice, lower prices, more jobs, and ultimately increased revenue for their provincial treasuries. Of course, I'm referring to Premiers Brad Wall, Christy Clark, Dave Hancock, Stephen McNeil, and Robert Giz, who are all actively working on a Canada-wide free trade zone. Premier, this is about nation building, growing our economy, and giving opportunities to our small businesses along Main Street here in Ontario. Premier, why haven't you called Premier Brad Wall and others to get started on this deal immediately, and why isn't Ontario at the head of the table? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, the member is very far behind on this file. The ministers have been speaking for some time on this issue, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the ministers right across the country had a conference call earlier in the week. Uh, and what's important, Mr. Speaker, is we, as, as, as sister provinces, continue to work together. It's important that the views of all provinces, including Ontario, be taken into con uh, consideration in terms of how to move forward in, in these uh, freer trade discussions amongst the provinces. We're all in favour of doing that, Mr. Speaker. We now need to work together to ensure we put in place the best process. Our Premier will, as she was with the Canada Jobs Grant and others, be, be a leader in this area of nation building across this country. We'll work closely with the Western provinces, the Eastern provinces, and Quebec. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we're determined to, shoot, to, to ensure we do the best job we can for Canadian businesses. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, uh, back to the Speaker. Uh, Premier, having negotiated over 40 international trade deals since coming into office, the federal government has done an outstanding job at opening trade barriers throughout the world. However, within Canada, there are a significant number of trade barriers in numerous sectors, including energy, labour and procurement. These barriers are costing average, everyday people with reduced opportunities, fewer jobs and higher consumer prices. Premier, the people of Ontario are counting on you to take the lead on important opportunities for our workers and small businesses. Premier, this is about Main Street, not Bay Street. Over the days ahead, what specific actions will you commit to with Ontario's participation in the job-creating Canada-wide free trade zone? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm really glad that the member brought up Stephen Harper today because I think what we want to do is ask the member if he's going to support our efforts to ensure that the federal government treats Ontario fairly when it comes to equalization payments, treats Ontario fairly when it comes to investments in infrastructure. You know, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about, and my, my predecessor in infrastructure was very clear on this, we're spending six times more, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to investing in public transit than the federal government's spending. I don't think you can find a country anywhere in the world where that exists. I believe my predecessor said it's 26 more times more that this province is spending on building roads and highways and bridges, Mr. Speaker. That is not good partnership when it comes to partnerships between the federal government and provincial government. So I'm hoping that the member yes, opposite sir. listens carefully to this and joins us in our efforts to make sure that Ontario gets fair treatment when Thank it comes you. to our relations with the federal government. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the Premier insists that she's bringing a progressive plan, and she's got a list that she loves to rhyme off, but there's another list in her budget, Speaker, uh, that Bloomberg, Bloomberg says will lead, and I quote, to the biggest Ontario cuts since Harris. Uh, and I'm just curious as to know uh, as to whether the Premier is going to be running on both of these lists or running with both of these lists next week. Will she introduce a budget on Monday uh, that includes having a conservative style fire sale of Ontario's public assets in its speaker. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, uh, the leader of the third party knows what our budget is going to say on Monday, Mr. Speaker, because we are reintroducing the budget that we uh, introduced at the beginning of May. We then ran our election campaign on that plan, Mr. Speaker. And the reality of our plan, Mr. Speaker, is that there is complexity to it. The fact is we are facing fiscal challenges. That is true. But the other fact is, Mr. Speaker, we are determined not to leave people behind. We are determined to build the province up, Mr. Speaker. We are determined to invest in people's talent and skills. The Minister of Economic Development was just talking about the investments in infrastructure. We are determined that we continue the investments. That, you know, the, one of the members opposite heckles that it won't happen, Mr. Speaker. The reality is it's already happening. You look at the investments in infrastructure Absolutely. that this government has made. You look at the, in the investments in education and in health care, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to build this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. So that's a yes for the fire sale of public assets. There's a number of things, however, Speaker, that the Premier has left off of her list. Families across Ontario are finding it harder than ever Order. just to make ends meet. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell is warned. Carry on. 
Families across Ontario are finding it harder just to make ends meet, Speaker. It's one of the reasons that they actually voted against austerity. They shouldn't go into a cold sweat every time they see their hydro bill. Leaving families working harder and harder just to pay the bill, Speaker, isn't progressive. When the Premier introduces her budget next week, will it get electricity bills under control for the good people of this province, Speaker, or will it be the Liberal status quo with hydro bills going up 42 per cent over the next five years? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I will just uh, just say again to the leader of the third party that it is incumbent upon government to do more than one thing at a time. Yes. And the fact is that we are we are faced with fiscal challenges in this province, and we are going to we are going to confront those fiscal challenges in a number of way, ways, Mr. Speaker. We are going to make sure that the constraints that have been put in place that have made us the the leanest government in terms of uh, program spending per capita in the country. We are going to keep those constraints in place, Mr. Speaker. We are going to make sure that we have a reliable energy system, system Mr. Speaker, that people across the province can count on, and that people, Mr. Speaker, whether they are business owners or whether they are individuals, that they know that they are going to have access to reliable power, Mr. Yes, Speaker. And we are going to make sure that the infrastructure that is needed across the province, roads, bridges, transit, that we are going to invest in that infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. It is incumbent upon us to do all of those things at the same time, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. So that's a yes to a 42 percent increase in hydro rates. People want to see a plan that creates jobs also, Speaker, and it's pretty obvious that that's been left off the list as well. The same old, same old, no strings attached giveaways haven't worked, Speaker. It's why Ontario's unemployment rate is stuck a, a higher than the national average. Handing money to corporations and hoping for the best is not a progressive value, Speaker. It hasn't worked for the last eight years. Why does the Premier think it's going to work all of a sudden? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's not what we're going to do, and it's not what we have been doing. Because, Mr. Speaker, the partnerships with business that have brought jobs to this province are, par are just that. They are partnerships. And the, the, the money that uh, is invested in partnership with business, Mr. Speaker, is tied to that job creation. That's exactly why we're putting in place the Jobs and Prosperity Fund, which will be part of our budget, which will be reintroduced on Monday. So the, uh, the Jobs and Prosperity Fund experience Ontario, Mr. Speaker, which will uh, will build on the success of the youth uh, employment strategy, Mr. Speaker, and will put young people into opportunities where they will uh, they'll have the opportunity to explore a new career path, Mr. Speaker, because we've partnered Answer. with business. Those are all things that are part of our budget, Mr. Speaker. Some of them are already in place and are working, but we are building on those successes. Thank you very much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. The Premier likes to pick and choose the parts of her budget that she wants to talk about, but there are some real surprises hidden just under the surface of this Liberal Trojan horse plan. People across Ontario are wondering whether they're going to be able to afford to retire. Speaker. Now, when the Premier tables her plan, will she still be moving at light speed to create Stephen Harper approved private pensions by this fall, but leave Ontarians waiting four years, if ever, for a public pension plan, Speaker? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, uh, I think what uh, I think what is most surprising about this particular gambit is that uh, we would have expected that support for an Ontario retirement All pension better. plan in the, absence, in the absence of uh, federal government leadership on enhancing the CPP, we would have expected that the NDP would have been right there at our side supporting the creation of an Ontario retirement pension plan. They're not there, Mr. Speaker, and you know, our is it important that people have options? And uh, in terms of the PRPPs that the uh, leader of the third party is talking about, will we move to allow people to have those options? Absolutely. But will we move to create an Ontario retirement pension plan so that people can count on a secure retirement? Absolutely, we will. And it is shocking, quite frankly, that the NDP is not going to support us on that. You see it, please? You see it, please? Supplementary. 
that's a yes to prioritizing Stephen Harper style PRPP speaker. Another part of her budget that the Premier loves to talk about is her transit plan. She insists it's a progressive plan. Well, here's the truth. The TTC, Metrolinx and the Golden Panel all agree that Toronto needs a downtown relief line. Anyone who takes the, the TTC in rush hour knows that the young line is already packed. Speaker. Instead, the Liberal plan will simply add more riders to the young plan. A downtown relief line that deals with congestion needs to be a priority. Is the Premier going to keep making things worse during rush hour for TTC riders, or will she put the downtown relief line to the top of the list? Speaker. She's doing nothing. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm just going to go to the, uh, the uh, general comment here that um, in terms of support for transit and putting $29 billion into uh, transit over the next 10 years, to work with municipalities, whether it's on uh, whether whether it's on public transit in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, or in Ottawa, or in Kitchener Waterloo, Mr. Speaker, or in Hamilton, or whether it is roads and bridges in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and in our rural communities, we are committed to doing that. That is in our budget, Mr. Speaker. And again, it would be terrific if we had the support of the NDP yeah. on that. Whether it is support for the uh, Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, Mr. Speaker, that is in our budget. We would have expected that the NDP would have supported us on that. Whether it's support for uh, people with developmental disabilities, Mr. Speaker, we would, have supported, yes, we would have expected the NDP to support us on that. Those measures are there. We are reintroducing our budget. We are determined to implement our budget uh, if we have uh, passage in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, and we think those are things that the NDP should Thank be you. supporting. Thank you. Final supplementary. So I guess that's a no to the downtown relief line being prioritized. You know, Speaker, the Premier likes to pick and choose the parts of her plan that she talks about here in the House, but there are other parts that she's a bit reluctant to talk about, like the parts that led Bloomberg News to say, and I quote, Wynne's budget foretells the biggest Ontario cuts since Harris. Parts like the new HST loopholes for big businesses and more no-strings-attached corporate giveaways. Now, is the Premier still committed to a plan that she insists is progress progressive, but will leave families paying more, will leave corporations paying less, and could lead to the biggest cuts since Mike Harris. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I am and we are committed to the plan that we have put forward and we have put in uh, front of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to building this province up. We are committed to making the investments that we know are necessary, Mr. Speaker, and we're committed to doing that in in partnership with municipalities, with businesses, Mr. Speaker, with communities across this province. And that is a complex interconnection of initiatives, Mr. Speaker. So there are transit initiatives, there are retirement security initiatives, there are constraint initiatives in terms of uh, the fiscal realities. All of those things are presented in our budget, Mr. Speaker, and the, the leader of the third party is right. There is a long list of initiatives that we believe the NDP should support us on, Mr. Speaker, because historically they have supported initiatives that have, uh, have lifted vulnerable Answer. people up and have helped them in their day-to-day -day lives. I, I continue to hope, Mr. Speaker, that as we reintroduce our budget, that we will see the NDP step up and support Thank those you. measures. New question, the member for Whitby Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, families across Ontario are waiting for the final report of the Select Committee on Developmental Services to be released. As you know, the committee travelled across Ontario and heard from hundreds of individuals and families that need help. Based on that, we wrote a comprehensive report that would have been released on the Monday after the election was called. Yesterday in the House, the new Minister of Community and Social Services said that we continue to strengthen the way we provide services to those with developmental disabilities. But what we heard in our committee over and over again, Premier, was that the system is broken. We have addressed those system systemic problems in our report and have provided concrete solutions. Premier, so my question to you is, will you recommit to restriking the Select Committee for this report? So, Mr. Speaker, I am extremely interested in the work of the Select Committee, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, this is an issue that a number of us in this House, on all sides of the House, have been concerned about for some time, which is why, Mr. Speaker, in our, Mr. Speaker, in our budget, there is $810 million to inject 
into the system, Mr. Speaker. I'm very aware that once, once a young person goes through our education system, at the end of that time, so at, at 21 years when, of age, when they age out basically from all of the supports that the education system has in place, there is very little. And in fact, there isn't a system, and we need a system, and we need supports for families. So that's why, that's why that money is in the budget, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly why we need to work with everyone who has advice for us. And as I said, I'm very interested in the report Answer. of the uh, Select Committee, and I think that we should absolutely pay attention to the work that was done there. Well, I would say Mr. to the Premier through you, Mr. Speaker, that committing the money is only one part of the yeah. solution. You need to know how to deal with the systemic problems that have been identified by the Select Committee in a nonpartisan way. These are solutions from all three parties. We've heard from hundreds of families who have children with autism that need treatment and help at school, for adults uh, with special needs who have their parents cannot take care of them anymore, they're having to drop them off at developmental services offices. We have hundreds, thousands of young people in Ontario who, when they turn 21, have nothing, no job, no life, no hope. We've addressed all of those issues in our Select Committee. I cannot understand understand why you committed this money and you don't even want to hear what the Select Committee has to say. Today, following question period, I will be asking for unanimous consent to have the Select Committee restructured so that it can file its final question and table it with this legislature. Will you commit to Thank you. I, uh, The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. While the uh, clock is stopped, I'm going to remind people um, that when I do warn you, there is no warning after that. You will be named. Premier. I know that this, uh, this issue is part of the discussions uh, that the, the House leaders are having right now, and so um, I understand that the politics of why uh, the member opposite, at least in part, is she's raising this issue. But, Mr. Speaker, I will not, I will not take, I will not take a lecture from a party that was going to cut billions of dollars from services across government, Mr. Speaker. I will not take lessons from that party, Mr. Speaker, when they were going to make those cuts. The fact is, we have put money in the budget to deal with these issues, and I want, I want to hear, I want to hear the advice of the committee. And the member opposite knows perfectly well that I want to hear, I want to hear those suggestions. And I know, I know that families need support, and I know we have to understand how that money should be spent. Seated, New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Welcome back, Minister. Up to 100,000 infants require childcare each year, but there are only 10,000 licensed spaces here in Ontario. There's a childcare crisis in this province, yet this government is making matters even worse. Cutting childcare funding to 18 communities from Sarnia to Sudbury is not progressive. It's not the right thing to do. Will the minister do the right thing and stop these cuts to childcare across Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Education. 
Yes, thank you. And, and uh, Speaker, uh, if I could digress for a moment, this is my first opportunity to speak in the House, and I'd like to start off by sending my console condolences to Absher Hassan's family. Uh, by all reports, he was a wonderful teacher. He was a wonderful mentor and role model for the children in his community. And we, we truly, uh, our heart goes out both to his family, but also to the Lawrence Heights School community because they obviously are devastated by this loss. So, let, let's talk about child care here and unpack what the, the member opposite just said. Because the, uh, the, the, the observations he's made are just factually incorrect. If you look at the funding record since 2003, in fact, we have added over $500 million to the child care budget. It's up to Answer. close to $1 billion. That represents a 90% increase, Speaker, in child care funding. And Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, notwithstanding what the ministers had to say, 18 communities are facing substantial loss of childcare, and that is irresponsible. That is short-sighted. Those communities deserve that funding. Those children, those families need that funding. No community, no family can afford these cuts to childcare. Will the minister explain why she refuses to listen to parents and refuses to stop these childcare cuts? Thank you, Minister of Education. Well, as I say, I under, I, I'm having trouble understanding the concept of cut when, in fact, we have continually increased the child care but the child care budget. And I'm not sure what my wardrobe has to do with child care, quite frankly. Uh, but the number of child care, not only is the funding increased, Speaker, the number of spaces has increased. So, in fact, there are 90,000 additional child care spaces since when we took government in 2003. And for the first time ever in the province of Ontario since child care moved to my ministry, we actually have a child care formula which is based on the number of children in the community. For the first time ever, we are yes, funding child care based. The member from Timmins James Bay is warned. Wrap up, please. Ten seconds. Yes, and in fact, this morning I have been very pleased to announce that we will be reintroducing our child care modernization act, which will, in fact, uh, facilitate the additional uh, creation of a. Thank you. New question. The member from uh, Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board. Minister, on Tuesday, the government reintroduced the Public Sector and MPP Accountability and Transparency Act, reaffirming Premier Wynne's commitment to make Ontario the most open and transparent government in the country by doing government differently. This bill demonstrates that the government is serious about being accountable to the people of Ontario. It would tackle the tough issues and further strengthen political accountability, open up the business of government, and strengthen oversight. The bill also builds on a number of legislative and non-legislative measures our government has already taken, including the Public Sector Expenses Review Act, the Broader Public Sector Accountability Act, and our implementation of the IPC's recommendations to enhance responsible government recordkeeping. Minister. Would you please speak to the proposed measures in this bill tonight, and how they would increase government accountability? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, let me start by uh, congratulating the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore on his win. And hey. I am sure that he will serve his constituents very, very ably as he has done for many years. 
Speaker, the Pro proposed Accountability Act in includes a wide range of measures that demonstrate that transparency and openness are top priorities for this government. It includes a range of measures which would, if passed, uh, strengthen accountability and oversight, including expanding the role of the Ontario Ombudsman to include municipalities, school boards and universities. It would strengthen the Lobbyist Registration Act. Compelling, it would compel agencies to post their business plans online and set compensation frameworks for BPS executives, including hard caps. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the President of the Treasury Board for detailing the ways in which this government hopes to strengthen accountability. I also understand that, if passed, the Accountability Act would require ministers, opposition leaders, and all MPPs and staff to post expenses publicly. Good idea. Uh, on this side of the House, government MPPs are already voluntarily posting their expenses online, and I strongly encourage the opposition to follow our lead and echo our commitment to open and transparent government. Uh, another crucial area where we have an opportunity to enhance accountability is in the health sector. Minister, would you please inform the House about the strong oversight powers included in this proposed act that apply to our air ambulance service as well as the new patient ombudsman role that will be created? Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And we are taking some uh, very concrete steps to increase oversight in the health sector. Amendments to the Ambulance Act would allow the government to appoint a supervisor and special investigators. Um, it would uh, protect whistleblowers who disclose information. Provincial representatives could be appointed to the Air Ambulance Service Board of Directors, and performance agreements with providers could be set by regulation at any time. Speaker, these are important enhancements. In addition, a patient ombudsman would be established to help patients resolve complaints they've got with public hospitals, long-term care homes and community care access centres. This new patient advocate or patient ombudsman would build a much more patient-centred and integrated approach. The patient ombudsman would be independent Answer. with all the powers of the ombudsman, including being able to initiate investigations as well as being required to post and make their annual reports Thank you. available to the public. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Calvin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. There was a formal complaint lodged against one of your assistant Crown attorneys concerning his conduct against women in the Peel Crown's office. According to the Sunshine List, the same Crown attorney walked away with $368,000 oh, in 2013, twice his annual salary. Minister, was a full investigation held regarding those allegations? Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for the question. I think it's a, it's a very uh, important uh, matter that you're raising. We have a policy within uh, the government, within uh, our ministry, to make sure that these things uh, are not happening. And uh, as you know, uh, we, uh, we are not talking about uh, these uh, incidents here in, in the House. And, uh, we, uh, but I can assure the, uh, the member uh, of the opposition that uh, all of these uh, accusations are uh, dealt with uh, within the ministry uh, in a fair and reasonable basis, but I want to reiterate the fact that, uh, you know, we have uh, policy in place uh, in this uh, government to make sure that uh, this does Answer. not happen, and it, when it does happen, measures are being taken to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, proper measures are taken to make sure that it does not happen again. Thank you, Thank you very much. S supplementary. Minister, I'm not sure that the victim in this harassment case believes that it was fair and equitable if you doubled the salary and pay of this person. In the same week you're promoting your new accountability and transparency legislation, the Ontario, in Ontario, the public has the right to know why an assistant crown in your ministry was given $368,000, twice his annual salary. For what? To go away? We've since learned that this same individual has now been charged with criminal harassment and assault against two young women. 
Minister, tell us why you chose to pay out an assistant crown instead of going through a full investigation to allow the victims and the accused a hearing and punishment if found guilty. Is that the kind of message you want to send to women who are dealing with harassment? Again, I'm going to, uh, to reiterate the fact that uh, in, in this uh, government, in each of our ministry, we had the procedure in place to make sure that the, these uh, uh, attitude or, uh, does not, or these action does not uh, happen. And uh, when this happens, measures are being taken to deal with it. And uh, what, with regard to uh, uh, how much uh, was uh, was paid to uh, to this individual, you know, uh, this uh, was dealt with uh, the same way than uh, these cases were dealt when you were in power. Thank you very much. Thank you. New question: The member from Hamilton East Stone Creek. Speaker, Speaker uh, this is to the minister responsible for the Pan Parapan Games. Speaker, it's a beautiful day, sunny day today. So I think work is probably being done on the Hamilton Stadium. At least, according to the minister, that's when they do their best work on good weather days. And we know that it's one year until the official opening of the Games. So it must be full steam ahead on all the venues. Speaker, can the minister provide us with a new date that the Hamilton Stadium will be ready for occupancy, weather permitting, of course? Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport, responsible for the 2015 Pan Am Games. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'm so proud of what we're doing here in Ontario in regards to the Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games. It's the, it's the first time that this province has taken on such a large responsibility, not only by itself, but working with the federal government, our 50 municipal partners. Exactly. We are working with our universities, our colleges, to put on the largest multi-sport game ever in the history, not only of Toronto or the Golden Horseshoe or Ontario, the entire country. This is the largest multi-game sport event in the entire country. We have, we have 31 venues. We have 15 venues that, that are being refurbished, 10 brand new builds, and we are going, and it, and it is a very complex case. We have Infrastructure Ontario working with us. Exactly. We have uh, different ministries working, and we're proud to build the type of infrastructure we need here in Ontario so our athletes can compete, not only not yes, only sir. here, but internationally, and we can attract the type of sporting events we want so Canada can take its stage in the world when it comes to athleticism. I and I hope the member opposite Thank joins you. us as we celebrate the Pan Am. Thank you. Speaker, with all due respect, the finance minister and the former minister responsible for Pan Para Pan Games mocked my concerns and assured this House on many occasions that everything's fine, we're on schedule, we're on budget. Well, the evidence is in, Speaker. Surprise, surprise, they're wrong. Speaker, they hired this foreign led consortium, they set the schedule. But do they have a plan to rein them in and get all the other venues on schedule, completed under budget? We've only got a year to go, Speaker. Speaker, will this minister tell the House how he's going to ensure that the Pan Para Pan Games venues are his and his government's priority and that they all get completed on time and on budget? And I've heard this before from you. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, you would think the member opposite would be excited uh, with the fact that we are building, we are building, we are building a state-of-the-art stadium in Hamilton yes. at the area that he represents. And his team, and I hope he's a fan of the Tiger Cats, his team will be able to play in a, in a stadium that holds 22,500 people. Yes. And I'll tell you, the last time the major infrastructure was put into that building was back in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was built back in the 1930s wow. when we had our last uh, Commonwealth Games here in the province of Ontario, the last multi-sport event. So I would hope that the member opposite would join us as we celebrate our athletes here in Ontario and across Canada, and we bring Toronto into and, and the 15 municipalities into the international stage so we can show off what we're proud of here in the province of Ontario and in our country. Yeah. 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 
New question? The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is also for the minister responsible for the 2015 Pan Am Games. Minister, people in my riding of Halton are starting to get very excited about hosting the cycling events at the Pan Parapan American Velodrome next summer. Some of the finest cyclists in the world will be competing at the world-class facility. People from all over the globe are expected to visit the region to take in the events. Now, This is a tremendous opportunity for the town and region to show the world what makes our area so special. The Games will put Milton, Halton and Ontario on the map internationally, and the state-of-the-art facility will have a lasting impact on our local athletes, community and economy. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please tell us why Question. the legacies are so important to both Ontarians and Canadians? Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to I congratulate the honourable member on a recent uh, election victory. Congratulations. I know you're going to make the people in your riding very proud. So today is a special day, Mr. Speaker. It marks the one-year countdown to the 2015 uh, Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games that are being held here in the GTA in the wow. Golden Horseshoe. And I think we should all be happy that we're, we have the ability to host such an incredible multi-sport uh, game here in the province of Ontario. So we're going to see um, a lot of investment into infrastructure, and we're, we're, going to see, uh, we're going to see an investment into infrastructure that will support our athletes here in the province of Ontario. And it's more than just the Pan Am Games. This is about building a legacy for our future, our future athletes here in Ontario, and not only Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but for all Canadians, because we are going from uh, just a, an average jurisdiction when it comes to multi-sport venues to a world-class venue, and we'll be able to compete internationally for future events, and I think we should be very proud of the investments Thank we're you. making. Thank you for your response, Minister. Halton is definitely gearing up to welcome the world next summer. This will be Milton's time to shine. It's great to see that the velodrome will be used by residents in my community for years to come. This will truly be the people's games. I think it is very fitting that the velodrome is located in our community. That's because the roads around our escarpment area are very popular with local bike enthusiasts. As Milton's Mayor Gord Krantz once said, Milton and Halton region Region is a cycling mecca. I understand that this will be the only facility of its kind in Canada and one of two in all of North America that will meet top international cycling competition standards. Mr. Speaker, again, through you to the Minister, can you please explain what other activities the velodrome will be used for once the Games are over? Thank you, Minister. Uh, again, uh, thank you to the member uh, for the question, Mr. Speaker. The games in Milton, uh, sorry, the games in Milton in the velodrome will be able to host not only uh, cycling, but we'll have uh, access to basketball, volleyball, badminton, a running and jogging track, a fitness center, a studio space, and a special area to host special events. And this is really for the community of Halton and the people in the surrounding area and all Ontarians. So the legacy piece again is an important piece. And as the members of Halton said, that. Canadians will no longer have to travel into the United States, into California, yeah. to train. They'll be able to do it here in Ontario, and I think we should be so proud of the fact that we're building that type of legacy infrastructure in Ontario to support our athletes, not only for today, but for future generations. Thank you. I have a straightforward question for the Premier. Could she inform the House what she is expecting will be the fastest-growing expense line item in the budget over the next three years. Premier. Can you read the budget, Minister, Minister of Finance? You can read it on Monday. Minister of Finance. Read it on Monday. Mr. Speaker, I can assure the member that uh, Ontario exceeds all other governments in Canada. We have controlled our program spending at 1.4 percent, which surpasses any government now. We're projecting to lower that program spending to 1.1 percent, Mr. Speaker, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would refer the Premier and the Minister of Finance to page 244 of the 2014 Ontario Budget Papers. That page shows that the fastest growing expense line item over the next three years is projected to be interest on the provincial debt. In fact, the average annual growth in our interest costs is expected to be almost 8%. I'll repeat that. 
an 8 per cent increase per year in our interest costs. We know that the Liberal government has doubled the provincial debt since taking office. We know that they intend to add $20 billion to the debt this year alone. We know that interest costs are already the third biggest expense in the budget after health and education. And we know that a credit rating downgrade is pending. And we know that with interest costs on the debt going up, available funding for vital services that we all value, like health care and highway expenditures, goes down. Knowing all that, how on earth can the government be so fiscally reckless as Question. to table the same budget next Monday as was rejected on May the 2nd? Minister. Mr. Speaker, what the people of Ontario rejected was 100,000 cuts that they were proposing to their employees. What the people of Ontario rejected was extreme measures of austerity that would put them in harm's way. What the people of Ontario accepted was this budget that we're presenting on Monday, a budget that talks about investing in their future so that we can promote more jobs, about making sure that we balance and eliminate the deficit by 2017-18 in a very balanced way. The people recognize that we must take a balanced approach. They know that the rate of cost of, of, of interest in Ontario has been sustained for the last 10 years, but we must be mindful not to pass a burden of debt on to future generations. That's why we are taking the steps necessary to eliminate the deficit. That's why we're taking the steps necessary through the present of the Treasury Board to find further savings in the system. That's why we're taking the necessary steps to maximize evaluations of our assets. That's why we're taking the steps necessary to promote more growth in our economy by investing in infrastructure and skills and training. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, yesterday you claimed that you were committed to making sure that your ministry comply with Toby's Act which, by the way, was tabled five times before your government acted. As is clear with the Avery Edison case, your ministry has not complied with Toby's Act. In fact, the Ontario government is being sued by Ms. Avery Edison based on discrimination in your ministry and mistreatment because of her gender. Does the minister intend on fighting her in the courts, or will he be settling? Thank you very much, Minister. I want to thank the member from Parkdale High Park for asking the question. I think the member opposite is, uh, would be fully aware of the fact that uh, that particular case that she referenced is before uh, the, the Human Rights Tribunal, so it would be highly inappropriate uh, for me as the minister to comment uh, on that particular topic. But, uh, Speaker, as I stated yesterday in this House in response to a question that I received from uh, the member from Ottawa, Orleans, I am very proud to have worked along with the member from, from Parkdale High Park and, and, with, uh, and the member from Whitby Oshawa on bringing Toby's Act and making sure that we protect the rights uh, of our trans community here in Ontario by explicitly including gender expression and gender identity in the Human Rights Court. In fact, Speaker, we're the first province in Canada to do so and some, as something that we all collectively should be very proud of. And as I stated in, uh, at the launch of the, uh, the guidelines yes, by the Human Rights Commission, on those particular provisions dealing with gender expression and gender identity that we will consult and work very closely with the Commission uh, to get our guidelines in accordance with the law. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Avery Edison was humiliated, she was strip-searched, she was sent to a male prison, she was kept in solitary confinement all because she is transsexual, and she is suing this minister's ministry because of her treatment. The minister claims his government is progressive. A truly progressive government would not fight Avery Edison in the courts. Will the minister commit to settling this matter with Avery Edison, or is he going to drag her through the justice system all over again? Minister. Uh, again, Speaker, I think the member opposite very well knows, and all the members in the House knows, when, that when a matter is before our courts or a uh, judicial system, uh, it is highly inappropriate for uh, the, the ministers to comment on that, and, and, uh, and therefore I, I cannot speak to that particular the facts are to the case, but I do, I do want to mention, Speaker, that our current ministry policy clearly states that the key consideration regarding uh, the care and custody of transgender and intersex inmates is the gender with which the in inmate identifies 
regardless of whether or not the inmate has undergone medically supportive treatments to align their physical bodies with their gender identity. Further, Speaker, it states that when transgender and intersex inmates are first admitted to our provincial correctional facilities, these individuals are permitted to choose the gender of the correctional yes, officer sir. who will perform the physical screening or elect to have both male and female staff involved in this process. We are updating our guidelines, Speaker, Thank and you. working very closely with the Human Rights Commission in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Etobicoke Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor for me to stand here in this House with all of you and represent the constituents of Etobicoke Center. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Mr. Speaker, due to a declining birth rate and an aging population, immigration will play an important role in filling highly skilled labour gaps in Ontario. The Federal Citizenship and Immigration Minister announced that he is launching the Express Entry Model, formerly known as the Expression of Interest Model. The federal government promises this new model will help Canada's immigration system become more focused on meeting Canada's economic and labour gaps. Mr. Speaker, we all know that the past federal changes to immigration policies have not always benefited Ontario. We have seen a steady decline in the share of skilled newcomers that we can select, while other provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan have benefited from much larger shares. Mr. Speaker, how will our government ensure Ontario is positioned to meet its labour market demands and continue to be a strong economic performer? Thank you, Thank you, thank you, Speaker, for the question. And Speaker, I want to congratulate the member from Etobicoke Centre. I'm sure he had a great election win. I'm sure that you're going to serve your constituents to be the best of your ability. Yes. Yes. Speaker, it's a bit late, but I do want to congratulate you for your re-election and still sitting in the best and most comfortable chair in the House. <laughs> Speaker, the member is correct. The federal government allows it is changing the way the country will process immigration applications. Speaker, immigration selection and immigrant settlement services should be a shared responsibility of all levels of government. I want to make it clear that we are committed. We are committed to ensuring Ontario is best positioned to recruit immigrants and recruit new immigrants now and in the future generation. Right now, we're working with provinces and territory to collaborate with the federal government on an express entry design and implementation. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Good. I'd like to thank the minister for his response and take this opportunity to congratulate him on his new portfolio and his new responsibilities as well. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is the number one destination in Canada for highly skilled newcomers and families. In fact, I'd like to share a brief anecdote. On Canada Day, I had the opportunity to attend a citizenship ceremony in Etobicoke Centre and was reminded of the diversity of newcomers and the caliber of skills and talents that they bring to our province every single day. Many high, highly skilled professionals like doctors, nurses, engineers and others come to our province hoping to seamlessly continue their practice and contribute to our vibrant economy. In my riding of Etobicoke Centre, for example, we have a large number of newcomers to Canada from all parts of the world, and although many have been able to find work in their field of practice, some have not been able to find work in their field of study or qualifications because their credentials are not recognized here. Mr. Speaker, how is our government helping highly skilled Question. newcomers become accredited in their field of practice? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the question again. One of the main pillars of this government's immigration strategy is to leverage the global connections of our diverse communities. Speaker, this is why Ontario will contribute more than 63 million over three years to the Ontario Bridge Training Program. Fantastic. Ontario's bridge training projects help internationally train skilled newcomers get licensed and employed in their field without duplicating previous training and education. Bridge training programs include nursing, pharmacy, early childhood education, medical laboratory technology and the skilled trace. Speaker, we are on the right track, but we know more needs to be done to make sure our newcomers can get jobs in their field of practice. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for your question. A member from Karen Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, we are very fortunate to have a unique model of primary health care serving our small rural communities in Perry Sound, Muskoka. Places like Britt, Argyle, Point of Barrow, Wata, First Nation, and Rosso are well served by nursing stations. We have seven nursing stations, mainly in Perry Sound District, providing vital primary health care in a very efficient model. 
Minister, the District of Muskoka has taken note of, what, of how well nursing stations are serving Perry Sound District. They have already submitted their plan for new nursing stations to the Ministry of Health. So my question, are you aware of the District of Muskoka plan to improve primary health care in Muskoka with new nursing stations? Good question. Minister of Health, welcome here. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question and uh, the reminder of the importance of that uh, great part of our province. Very lovely, beautiful part of the province. Most importantly, the people there are uh, extremely uh, generous and hardworking. And so, uh, of course, anything uh, that has to do with our nursing profession and making sure that as a government we improve the services, in this case, as provided through our hardworking nurses and nurse practitioners, our RNs, uh, it is something that I take very seriously. I I haven't had the opportunity yet. I think the member opposite appreciates uh, having been in the portfolio for uh, just two weeks, but uh, I uh, will certainly uh, entertain uh, getting to this immediately, uh, asking my officials to brief me on it so I can see uh, pr uh, the particulars of the proposal. But I want to, and perhaps I have an opportunity in supplementary to speak uh, more generally yes, about the important work that our nurses are doing and how we're supporting them to do that work even more effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for the response, and uh, let me provide some more details. Uh, the District of Muskoka has come up with a Made in Muskoka health care plan to improve primary health care access based on the success of nursing stations serving Perry Sound communities for many years. Their plan includes new nursing stations in Dorset, Severn Bridge, Port Severn, and Port Carling to improve primary health care for the elderly low-income and marginalized seasonal residents and tourists. Minister, this improved access to health care services is very important for Muskoka now and into the future. So my question, would you agree to meet with District Chair John Plink and consider their plan to spend health care dollars more efficiently and improve primary health care for Muskoka? Thank you, Minister. Of course, I'd uh, welcome the opportunity to meet with the, uh, the district chair. And uh, let me say that, uh, again, in reference to the important work that our nurses across the province do, uh, um, we, uh, in fact, I think this was referenced earlier, since 2003, we've, in fact, added 20,500 nurses to the province. And, in fact, uh, over um, uh, uh, many of those, 4,000 of those, have been added to the province in just the last year alone. We're introducing and increasing the number of uh, nurse practitioner-led uh, clinics, and I want to speak to the element of this, which is, I think, perhaps most appealing, and that is it's a local community, a local district, which is coming up with a plan which reflects the unique priorities and unique circumstances that take place in the District of Muskoka. So I'd be very happy to meet with this individual, of course, to learn more about the program. I'll get briefed uh, in detail by uh, my ministry, and we'll, we'll see uh, if perhaps we can move forward in a uh, collaborative uh, way to see uh, how we can continue to improve services. Question number from Nickelbelt. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for French Services this morning. New Democrats are very proud to promote and defend French services for Franco Ontarians. We are proud of the work that we've done to contribute to um, make our commissioner an independent officer of the Legislative Assembly. However, this morning, our commissioner told us and this, these are his words, that the government did not listen to his recommendation regarding French services and human resources plans. These recommendations have been completely ignored, but we've also been told that the, go the government does not respect the act on French services by uh, tabling reports on its activities. My question is very simple. Why does the government not respect our commissioner or the French Services Act? The minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to be part of a government that supports Francophonie in Ontario. It is this government that's created the position of French Language uh, Services Commissioners. The commissioner has given us recommendations. I think it's his sixth or seventh report. His recommendations are always taken very seriously and we have made a lot of progress in Francophonie in Ontario and Francophones do recognize that. There are recommendations that are reviewed and put forward. We study them. 
and there these are recommendations and so we work very closely with the different ministries that are involved in order to make sure that recommendations made by the commissioners are taken seriously and we will keep working closely with the commissioner and recommendations by the commissioners the commissioner said that we should have a report every year and we are studying his recommendations very closely thank you with the Oshawa on point of order, point of order. I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice to restrike the Select Committee on Developmental Services and prevent its final report. The member from uh, Whitby, Oshawa, is uh, seeking unanimous consent to put a motion without notice. Uh, do we agree? No. I've heard enough. Um, the uh, a point of order from the government house leader. Speaker, we, we very much uh, uh, like this idea, and and uh, we. This is an issue that has been discussed at the house uh, with the house. That's uh, that's that that's not a point of order. I uh, we have a uh, deferred vote. Uh, government order number one: the motion to address in reply to the speech to His Honor Lieutenant Governor at the opening of the session. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
The members take their seats, please. Members take their seats, please. Sergeant at Arms will come for you. Voting on government order number one. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Nakvi. Mr. Nakvi. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Van Mayer. Van Mayer. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martins. Ms. Mrs. Martins. Mr. Mc Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Europe. Mr. Europe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Ms. Horvath. We should be sung. Should be sung. Ms. Denova. Ms. Denova. Madame Jalina. Madame Jalina. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. Tories in a hurry. The ayes being 57, the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that a humble address be presented to His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, as follows. To the Honourable David C. Onley, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, we, Her Majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, the Legislative Assembly of for the Province of Ontario, now assembled, beg leave to thank, you, thank Your Honour for the gracious speech Your Honour has pleased to address to us at the opening of the present session. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.